Welcome back everyone, this is Angel Miller with People of Shambhala. This evening we're going to be speaking with Greg Kaminsky, publisher of A Code of Personality. Uh, a Code of Personality has become well known over the last few years for its interviews with uh, academics, authors, uh, and spiritual practitioners. Uh, it certainly has a very interesting uh, mix of guests, you should check it out. This evening, Greg and I will be speaking about technology, terror, and transcendence. Uh, we cover quite a range of uh, subjects around that, from um, Ernst Jünger and Alistair Crowley to uh, technology as an aid to spiritual practice, uh, technology and terrorism, the threat to net neutrality, and, uh, and fear in the age of technology. Well, I hope you enjoy. Greg Kaminsky, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's good to be speaking to you again. And, and you as well. Uh, great. And uh, we spoke a few months back about uh, spirituality and the, the modern world. And uh, we, we're just going to yeah. revisit um, that kind of issue from a slightly different angle. We're going to be looking at more at, uh, technology and, uh, uh, and spirituality today and uh, where there may be conflict and this sort of thing. So um, the Titanic came up in a couple of books I was reading recently. Uh, one of them is uh, Anti-Fragile by Nassim Nic Nicholas Tlaib. I don't know if you you know him. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the author of the Black Swan book. That's right, that's right. And he's certainly, he's a fascinating thinker. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely recommend people uh, learn a bit more about his work and uh, and read some of his writing. It's really worth reading. And, uh, and the other one is um, The Forest Passage by Ernst Jünger. And what struck me is uh, their take on the Titanic is so extremely different. And for uh, Talib, he says that uh, ultimately, although the sinking of the Titanic was, uh, you know, a horrific incident, that uh, ultimately society, in a sense, gains from that because uh, without that disaster, we just would have kept building bigger and bigger uh, ships, and eventually, an even bigger ship would have gone down, and it would have been a much worse accident and um, much bigger loss of life. So he says that, well, you know, this uh, th this actually saved lives in a way and uh, put us back on course and um and Ernst Jünger takes a different approach and that is that uh it's actually not a good thing for society that it happened in fact he says um that uh, today we live in a, a time of fear and um although we know we no longer live in the times of you know Dickens uh the sort of uh the, the real abuse of, of workhouses of children and destitution and poverty and this sort of thing we don't really have that in the west anymore but nevertheless there's this fear and he says you know how how did it come about and he says if you want to pick a turning point uh none could be more appropriate than the day the titanic went down he says and he he goes on uh, here light and shade collide starkly the hubris of progress with panic, the highest comfort with destruction, and automatism with a catastrophe manifested as a traffic accident. And uh, and I think he's right in a certain sense that, uh, you know, here you have technology and uh, it, it doesn't go how you think. You know, you think that the, the Titanic is going to be this great thing, but actually it's a massive destruction. Yeah, and now if, do you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but oh, I, no, I found ahead. this, like, really... Uh, a poignant quote from Junger, yeah. and I'm curious of your opinion uh, because he he picks this event of the Titanic as the turning point yeah, where right. sort of technology and man's hubris sort of like being brought out into the open, having this sort of tower moment, if you yeah. will. Um, but but he lived through World War One. Yeah, that's and and that's not the event that he picks that illustrates his point even more starkly i find that shocking yeah i think um yeah i, I, I initially that is a, that is a kind of curious thing right why not pick that out because there were millions of people killed the cities leveled you know raised to the ground it was utter yeah, destruction, destruction yeah. never ever seen before yeah and i think what it is for him is um that ultimately the titanic is presented as a good thing whereas you know war is not presented as a good thing at all well mm -hmm. i guess you, you could argue that it is but you know we we know that war means death right but for him the titanic was this promise of luxury and a man's uh man's sort of uh attainment over uh nature and over yeah. the, you know progress 
No one would say that, that war so, is progress. I think. Yeah. So you don't you don't expect the the uh, catastrophe on the Titanic. Whereas if you yeah. go into battle, you kind of know it's coming. Yeah, and no one would really say that. Well, war is progress, right? But everybody thought, well, you know, that's uh, that's the future, yeah. and that's progress, and we've all got to be more like that. We, we should build bigger ships and uh, more luxury and this sort of thing. And then it turns out to be this. Uh, uh, moment where it's uh, you have luxury, but you also have uh, you know uh, mass slaughter in a way. So it, it turns out to be the opposite. And I think you know with the net we have that as well. Where I mean, you and I, I'm sure we like the net a lot, but you know it has a darker side as well. Where you know we've probably been spied on, and you know having all our emails read, or maybe you know computer viruses and this sort of thing. So yeah, I mean honestly, like uh, I think it's easy to get. Uh, worked up about like surveillance and the NSA and all that stuff but to be honest with you like things like identity theft and that is like a far more uh, real threat from the internet than uh, the government at this point anyway at least where we live it's uh, anything people create uh, this the sort of positive aspects and then you build negative if you will aspects and the internet certainly is a great illustration of that yeah 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 definitely i mean i think like the the leaps and in, in technology um are amazing but as human beings you know there are going to be some of us who attempt to put these technologies to uses that you know <laughs> could be uh, perceived as threatening. So how, how do you feel that uh, technology in the modern era and spirituality kind of go together or, or uh, maybe conflict with one another? Well, I think it's like a two sides of a coin or two edges of a sword. You know, on one hand, it allows people access to information and connection to others that they yeah. otherwise would never, ever have. Uh, we have access to all the great minds and their writing. We have access to videos and audio and all sorts of teachings and books, you know, from hundreds of years, um, which is wonderful. Uh, the flip side of that is uh, rather than becoming more knowledgeable or wiser, it seems uh, the exposure to this much information results in often like an information overload. So uh, it requires some discipline. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to try to drink out of a fire hydrant. You know, it's right. just, it's you have to be somewhat disciplined uh, with what you're accessing and you know, any kind of information that you're trying to avail yourself of. Uh, it, there's, a, there's other aspects to the technology, too. I think uh, the surveillance aspect of it, the uh, way that ideas spread through the net, like we call them viral, right? right. It's, and they behave almost like a virus, these ideas. Um, and sometimes these ideas are... Uh, less than savory, and other times yeah. these ideas are downright incorrect. Yeah. But they spread anyway because they're sensational or they're presented as real or as fact, and people may not check and simply be caught up in it. But with all the, the negative aspects of the technology, we also have uh, a positive thing that we can get out of it, I think, which... Yeah which is, uh, you know, any time man's spirit is restricted or he feels restricted, uh, there's going to be some tension there. So if we feel like we're constantly being surveilled or recorded or watched, right, right. you know, that gives us an opportunity to think about why this might make us uncomfortable, why... Others may feel the need to do this. Mm. Uh, what this teaches us about ourselves and humanity in general. Mm. Um, I think it's kind of like uh, that sort of uh, Gnostic challenge, if you will, where you're in a situation that's uncomfortable, may not be of your choosing, and it allows you a chance to grow and transform because you are challenged. It's not necessarily uh you know just 
take it easy and and be comfortable it's you have to figure out how am i going to deal with this do i do i need to take practical steps to, to right. hide myself to you know or do i need to take uh more radical steps to completely change the way i look at this situation and feel about it yeah so because i think we we sometimes suffer from a sort of a uh, like a rosy glasses effect when we look at the past. Um, oh, for sure, absolutely. You know, and yeah. I think with uh, some of the younger quotes that you sent, like I agree in in essence with what he says and his perspective, but I also feel like he is of the opinion that what came before was more pure. Uh, man had more freedom in the past, or at least freedom from the fear of of his own creation to some mm -hmm. extent. Um, and I think you know it, this is very true in, in a sense, but it's also not uh, as accurate a depiction of everyday life in the past. Um, because I, yeah. you know, I think unless people had some degree of wealth or autonomy, life was just not that comfortable. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you know, he talks about the Titanic yeah. as being this turning point. But, you know, if you look just maybe a couple decades prior, you know, Edwardian England, you know, the servant class, uh, you know, this class society, uh, most people, I think didn't have a, a life that was as comfortable as it might be today in the physical sense. Um, and, and I think, you know, we might have to question, you know, did they have a more of a, like a self-sufficiency, a self-reliance, uh, ability to entertain themselves and to use their imaginations more than we do now? Yeah. So I think it's, it, every age has its challenges. Ours might be a little bit more... Uh, dystopian though yeah and um, regarding turning points you know um, personally I was thinking as well of uh, William Blake's uh, poem uh, and did those feet in ancient times and, and there's a reference to the satanic mills in it which is sort of enigmatic but it's a reference to the uh, industrialization of uh, mm -hmm. of Britain and he's uh, looking at this sort of industrial process cropping up and you know what it what it's like to work in those places is pretty un, uh, un, unwholesome you know and uh, certainly in in uh, in the past uh you know as you say if you had money it was a, a nice time but for uh, for many other people especially crowded into cities it could be really really appalling yeah one of the quotes that i found as i was doing some reading on this subject was uh a quote from Crowley, which is uh, from a letter he wrote in, I think, 1945, where he says, um, there is a vile threat to the rugged American individualism that actually created the USA by the bureaucratic crowd who wants society to be a convict prison. Safety first. There is no social insecurity, no fear for the future, no anxiety about what to do next in Sing Sing. All the totalitarian schemes add up to the same in the end, and the approach is so insidious, the arguments so subtle and irrefutable, the advantages so obvious, that the danger is very real, very imminent, very difficult to bring home to the average citizen who sees only the immediate gain and is hoodwinked as to the price that must be paid for it. Now, if that doesn't describe the years that we've been living in since 2001, I don't know what does. Because to me, that is an exactly a pr apropos quote that completely describes the mindset. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, there's definitely a, a push towards uh, trying to make society more comfortable for people and less dangerous. And in, in a way, that's, you know, that's nice. I'm sure we'd, you know, like more comfort. But uh, at the same time, it does sort of um, it does uh, it does kind of imprison people in a way. In, in Britain, for example, uh, there have been cases where people have been arrested for uh, you know apprehending a burglar and this sort of thing. And oh uh, yeah, in there's there's situations 
here where people are arrested for things like blocking pedestrian traffic on the sidewalk in front of their house. You know? <laughs> and this is, I mean, this is like a class thing or maybe a race thing. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, th yeah, this type of uh, control uh, over people is, yeah, it's uh, very unsettling, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think maybe it's a, an inevitable uh, part of, uh, I don't want to say progress, but you know what I mean, in in that uh, things become more and more refined and laws, uh, you tend to get more and more laws as time goes on and then more and more sort of sub laws and whatnot. And, uh, and you know, by definition, it becomes a little bit undemocratic because you can't really know every law that's out there if there are thousands and thousands of them. So you don't really know if you're even breaking the law or not sometimes. Yeah, it's it's quite something. I mean, yeah, the things that that really I find really egregious, I, I guess, are the the larger things. The uh, the use of uh, like this whole like the terror. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this whole idea of sort of a ongoing military campaign against a form of warfare or philosophical position which yeah. i mean that's how could you ever possibly bring that to an end i i don't yeah. you know it's just it's just because just manufacturing more opponents all the time by yeah. every action you manufacture more opponents and at some point don't we have to ask is it by design or you know it, who who's who's not in char in charge of long term planning here or, or is someone, and this is, you know, doing it on purpose. I, I don't know. Yeah, I know. I mean, I think more and more people are actually feeling like that, um, you know, whether it is by design or whether it's just a, a, def uh, a fault of democracy where people only think a few years ahead or maybe just a few months ahead where, you know, yeah. the next president will be voted in, this one voted out, or the next prime minister voted out, whatever it is. And so maybe maybe it's just a fault of democracy and pe people in the West thinking short term, you know, that are that are in power. But um, yeah, I mean, I think anecdotally, it do, uh, the uh, strategy does not seem to be working uh, to get rid of terrorism at all. Um, it's uh, it seems to be very unfortunate, and I think uh, you know uh, there seems to be a bit more soul searching about that uh, in the West in general. I think it is perplexing. I think so too. Um, there's another quote I wanted to read that kind of followed on with that one I read just a minute ago. Oh sure. Um, and this is again Crowley, I think, but in a separate letter to a different person, where he says, uh, "As I think that totalitarian methods are already on the way to extinguish the last spark of manly independence that is in self-styled civilized countries, it seems to me that we." All should regard with shrewd suspicion any plans for perfecting social conditions. Mm. The extreme horror is the formula of the gregarious type of insect. Inherent in the premises is the impossibility of advance. So he's, he's in his mind, uh, perfecting society results in a static situation where people don't have any ability to change their situation or to act independently or yeah. think think for themselves and act on their own yeah um, and and he also identified this uh concept of the busybody this person who decides that they know best what's right for them and for you yeah, and this is this is almost the mindset of the, of the government in a way it, when it becomes this uh, parental type of uh, force where it's like we know what's best for you, so we're going to watch over you, and if you do something we don't like, then you know you'll there'll be consequences. Yeah, uh, I think that's very true, and but I would say as well that. Um uh, it's, it also seems to be uh, part of the zeitgeist outside of any government as well. I mean, even if you go on Facebook, it seems to be a lot of people uh, telling everybody else uh, what they should should and should not be uh, doing. Yes. And I think yes. It, and I think extremely strange in this day and age is that 
uh, a lot of people who feel really feel that they're outside the system actually say things that are very mainstream and would be endorsed by the government, but they sort of think it's very radical. Yeah, I think it's once you have your sort of cultural leaders embrace it, whatever it is, then it's it's become the mainstream. Yeah, definitely. Like, even though, even though maybe even the majority of people may not agree with it, it doesn't no, matter no. anymore because they're not they're not the ones that set yeah the 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 culture. You know, they just so yeah. I, I feel like there's been a, a lot of uh, shifts in, in that respect, but um, the uh, you're right though that this idea of like the busybody or people thinking they know best for other people, I think, is just horrible in in many respects um uh yeah yeah i i feel like that is on a small scale what's going on you know it's just really a ref uh, a smaller like reflection of what's happening with the government or uh, you know sort of whoever is in charge kind of uh, is it's very much a reflection of that and maybe that makes sense you know people are told what to do or what to think so they automatically want to turn around and tell other people what to do and think yeah that's right absolutely yeah, I think that's part of it. But I, I think uh, from you know my perspective and maybe our perspective, it's sort of uh, it's uh, unfortunate because um, uh, when sort of outsider values become mainstream, uh, it's, it seems to crowd out any possibility of thinking about things differently. And that's not necessarily in a way that would be shocking to a society. It's just uh, you know there are many other ways to think about things, and we you know there are, we can name uh, different ways of thinking today that really are not represented on the television I mean, if you're a hindu if you're a muslim if you're uh, you know something like that i mean they have different ideas i mean i consider myself to be a follower of dharma that's a different idea to uh, the mainstream but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily conflicting with it but uh, uh that's not going to be represented on uh in the on mainstream television and i don't think you could really see or hear about that even on the fringes as well because it's very much a kind of um in lockstep i think really and there, there are many other ways of looking at the world and um, it would be good to have uh, at least to entertain different ideas even if we just decided well those ideas are wrong or you know at least it would sort of challenge our way of thinking but so that we could refine it a little bit yeah i do i do think that happens gradually over time and not necessarily with the same person like as a society that yeah. shift occurs but uh I do kind of wonder, like, uh, for instance, like, uh, maybe, say, if someone was a conservative Buddhist or some, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. some minority that wasn't really represented in mainstream American culture in the same way as, uh, you know, even these outsider values that you talk about, um, how much their mindset or opinions or perspective is valued in their own traditional culture you know what i mean like mm. uh sometimes like conservative or uh devout religious sects um even even in their own culture still aren't f like mainstream you know what i mean yeah. so so i i kind of wonder like uh Yes, they're outside. They they don't fit in. They're not in the mainstream in the American milieu. But maybe they're not in uh, in their own culture either. In some ways. Yeah, I know that's true. Absolutely. But um, you know, I think it would be uh, good to hear different different views in the West more than we do. And I'm, I'm not sure if we hear views more or, or less. But I, s I sense that we may be hearing them a little less than we did before. I think we hear a lot more diversity of views but I feel like what we get is often cast in a way that is more acceptable yeah 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 and maybe that's to make it accessible rather than mm. acceptable but it ends up being the same thing I think yeah uh, and, and I, I, I find this a lot in like the ideas of like comparative religion where mm. they're not equating necessarily but 
to someone who doesn't know the subtle differences, it seems that way. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And I and I think that that is a danger in um comparative religion that it can be taught like that and it can certainly be consumed like that. And I think that you know, we've all seen those sort of cliched uh sort of stickers and things you see around where all the religions are considered to be one and they're all you know, Wicca is just the same as Islam and Islam is just the same as Hinduism and Hinduism is just like Christianity. What's what's the big deal? And and I, and I think you know, there's definitely merit into saying that there are uh, ways of seeing them which can be compatible, or that there are ways of understanding different religions. And there are certainly many different ways of understanding each religion. But uh, I, I think it's a stretch to start comparing, say, Wicca and Islam. I mean, I, th I think oh, that's yeah. cr kind of crazy. Definitely crazy. Yeah. Um, there's some other uh, ideas that are sort of not necessarily related to what we're just talking about, but. Yeah. Um, with regard to technology and spirituality, because I, I think, I don't know, I, speaking for myself, my own personal instinctual inclination is that spirituality kind of harkens back to a past, a more ancient time, things made by hand, uh, this idea of craftsmanship with mm. uh, ritual items. Um, yeah. You know, things that are not virtual. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. But that's a prejudice on my part. Uh, I think there is a way that a technology can be incorporated into spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a website, or I, I don't know exactly what it is, but the, it's called Hyper Ritual. Okay. And this guy takes computer devices or electronic devices and kind of incorporates them into his magical practice. Okay. And I, th I find this just amazingly breathtaking, what he's doing, because it's something I would never think of. Um, and, and I do feel like there are opportunities for people to absorb the almost overly technological environment that we exist in now and mm. have a genuine authentic Gnostic type experience a, as a result of that they could then speak to other people's experience in the yeah. modern world and I, I, I think maybe you know Philip K. Dick might have been kind of that type of mm. uh, figure but I, I do think there are opportunities as technology continues to become more advanced and become more accessible to people mm -hmm. that this this incorporation of more modern technology into spirituality is bound to happen yeah and i, I think actually it has to happen and i think in different ways it's already happened and i mean you know your website a cult of personality um is an example of that i mean not only are you uh, able to uh, give uh, authors and spiritual practitioners a platform, but I mean, I think, you know, the way you run it, you want to be uh, ethical as possible and you want it to be in line with your own, you know, your own authentic self, right? Which is yeah. the spiritual uh, way. So, you know, it's going to represent that. And, you know, and in other ways as well, there are, you know, apps to help you meditate or, you know, you can go on YouTube and find, uh, videos on everything from kung fu to meditation. So, I mean, there are definitely ways that you can use the uh, internet to, um, you know, to really uh, help you in your uh, spiritual journey. Uh, and, and that's a that's a, absolutely a, a, an amazing thing that w we couldn't have had twenty years ago. So, yeah, I mean, I there's always the danger that the fascination becomes with the technology or with the item yeah, rather yeah. than it pointing into inside where it's supposed to be a representation of yeah but um i do think there are things i've seen that that actually work very well like um some of these um binaural beats uh these recordings that people listen to to sort of induce uh meditative states you know, now some might argue that it takes the actual work out of it, but if you can get into the state, uh, I'm not sure that it really matters how you do it.
Um, I, because yeah. I, I feel like if you can do it enough with uh, the technological aid, eventually you're going to be able to do it without it. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not uh, it's not a million miles away from more traditional things like using music as part of uh, meditation. Mm-hmm. So right, uh, right. it doesn't seem like an enormous leap, but obviously the technology is there to enable yeah. this. Yeah. So, yeah, so th- that's definitely true. And I think, um, you know, that's something to definitely be thank- thankful for, that, you know, all this stuff is available to us. And, you know, obviously we have to um, make sure that what we're doing is in line with our own you know authentic self with uh you know to use a hindu or buddhist term with dharma with a uh, some might interpret that natural law or whatever mm-hmm. and um you know uh, you know it's not just to go within but also to make sure that we are living out you know spiritual or cosmic principles or however, however you want to put it but uh yeah i mean this certainly can be a huge aid absolutely yeah i think so too um but I, and then I, I see sort of a, f- again, sort of another side of it, which is um, any society that's been subjected to the more militaristic aspects of our technology may have a opposite reaction, you know, right, sort, of, right. sort of becoming more uh, primitive and... Uh, not adopting technology because it comes from uh, people who want to do them harm or they perceive so. Yeah, I don't know, actually. I think um, I think actually uh, people are adopting technology, and I think that e- even, um, I mean, I, I guess you're talking about uh, Muslim, Muslim states, but I think even in those states uh, there is a lot of adoption of, uh, of technology, which... Uh, in, in many cases, comes from the West, but I think they're sort of maybe in a way sometimes subverting it, or sometimes um, uh, using it for other purposes. And I, and I, and that goes. And there's a whole range there, obviously. And I, I don't want to uh, lump um, anyone together at all. But you know, from the one end, you have uh, something like Taqwa Core, which is sort of like punk rock and and Islam. Uh, sort of rolled in together, and it's sort of as, and just the Muslim youth culture uh, in general, where it's we don't always know what's going on in the West, but it's a lot more vibrant than one might imagine. And then totally disassociating uh, this, what I'm about to say from them, because you know uh, there's no connection. But you know, uh, say in Afghanistan or something, and then you have, you may have the Taliban, which is obviously an extremely conservative and so sort of radically conservative. Uh, Muslim uh, and, and sort of militant uh, group, but uh, you know at the same time they are able to uh, adopt Western technology, whether it's weapons or whether it's uh, Twitter. I think they've had a Twitter account since two thousand and five. You know, so okay, so yeah. that's probably not a great example. I think one thing, one that comes to mind, which but is probably a big outlier, and they were totally insane with like the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, oh, where they yeah. totally like went primitive and. Yeah, you know, just wanted to wipe out any trace of uh, modern technology, except yeah. for the people in charge, of course. You know. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and I guess maybe North Korea is a little bit like that as well, where they're importing, you know, Western cognac for the leaders, while the you know people <laughs> people can barely live on, you know, a cup of rice a day or whatever it is. But yeah, I mean, the Khmer Rouge is a completely bizarre. Uh, Phenomenon, right? Because I mean, they they uh, said they were communists or claimed to be communists, but uh, but they really had this sort of like back to the land philosophy of you know, obviously killing people uh, in the millions to uh, sort of make it a sort of, sort of uh, agrarian yeah, they, society. Yeah, they wanted to wipe yeah. out wipe out anybody who was educated. Yeah, just like bring society like back to the stone age yeah, almost. That's right. That's what, yeah, literally, I think pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I don't know that that was like a reaction to being terrorized by tech, like you know, in 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 the same way uh, as we see nowadays. Certainly. Yeah. Um, so it's probably you're right. Uh, technology in general does seem like uh, when people can get it in their own hands and use it to be yeah. liberating and uh, it sort of like pointing them towards more freedom in, yeah. a, in some way 
and when you know maybe when the government uses it uh it's a little bit different yeah i mean so obviously the thing about technology is it's essentially neutral and it can be used or misused for lots of different purposes and but uh but yeah i mean i think as well as you're saying there will be groups that simply just drop out of technology uh there will be people who use it more and more and become like cyborgs and then others that sort of go and live on go and create a farm in the middle of nowhere and that's what they'll want to want to do yeah. so yeah, there definitely will be reactions whether it will be you know divided in uh, the whole countries will be like that I, I i don't think so but maybe within each countries you'll have super highly technological individuals and then really really agrarian societies and sort of anarchist groups that are living you know in the middle of nowhere yeah it's possible i mean it's also possible that the the internet as we've known it and our access to relatively cheap but advanced technology is transitory in a sense yeah it could be you know the way they talk about net neutrality or yeah. a two-tiered internet i mean if something yeah. like that were to happen i i imagine um the internet in general would be a lot less attractive as a way of sharing information and learning and uh, and become much more of an entertainment device. Yeah, right. And and two tiered. Um, the sort of two tiered idea of the internet is that uh, there will be paying uh, large. Uh, websites run by big corporations that would have a uh, sort of premium service where you, you could uh, access their their websites, and they would run very fast. And then there would be smaller websites uh, where they didn't pay as much, and it would run very slowly and would be a bit of a torture to look at those. And uh, I think most yes. people, uh, most people would probably want to look at those small sites. Uh, you know, you, you, you think about the, the sort of memes that. Uh, just go on Facebook and lead to these sort of obscure websites. Maybe you know, maybe it's a bit of a flash in the pan. Often, but that's part of the the interest. A big part of the interest of the internet. I mean, I don't I don't think we really want to look on the internet to to watch CNN particularly or whatever <laughs> it is. You know, no. Although that's up there, I'm sure. But uh, you know, yeah. So it's a it's definitely a bit of a quandary. But yeah, I think um, yeah. If if we had that, then it would be a, it would be a real disaster. But uh, so maybe you can just talk a bit about um, your your own relationship with uh, technology, you know, because of your website and uh, sure. how you see it. Well, um, I I think it's a good tool. Um, I I enjoy the fact that we're able to spread information and share ideas and publish our. Our thoughts and words online for anybody with a computer and internet access can yeah. get to it. Um, I think that's truly amazing yeah. thing, and I feel like we're blessed to have that ability. But I also feel like we shouldn't take it for granted. We shouldn't assume that tomorrow and the next day and for every day in the rest of our lives this is always going to be of there whenever we turn it on and ready to go I think well my study of history tells me that that's unlikely yeah I think so too absolutely um, I, I feel like we've had a time when it was a free for all online and people who had nothing could start a website and grow it into a huge business yeah um, and the potential is still there for that however um, as time goes on I feel like that is going to change um, it, it's definitely going to change so in with regard to you know the dissemination of esoteric philosophies and ideas and books and things of that nature. It's been a tremendous boon. I don't think there would be any sort of occult revival in the way that we're seeing without technology, which in some ways seems paradoxical to me. Mm. You know, um, studying ancient philosophies and ideas and religions and things and using the most modern 
methods to get the information out there I find paradoxical and kind of fun mm. but um, I, I do worry though like uh, and maybe maybe this is part of like this you know fear is symptomatic of our times you mm. know I, I have right. this this looming feeling like that someone's going to flip a switch and yeah. you know all of a sudden the only websites we're going to be able to get to are Facebook, Amazon and Google or you know and maybe a few others. Right, right. Yeah, I think you're right. And it, and maybe that is happening a little bit with um you know the way search engines are, are set up. I don't, I mean I don't know. I mean it, it But I think be... you publish your uh your interviews on YouTube, right? Yeah, that's right. See, I think that's probably going to be the more dominant model going forward because if it's available on YouTube, YouTube's owned by Google, they won't have any trouble getting Yeah. No one will have trouble getting to the website. Yeah. And your your interviews will be easily accessible. Yeah. Uh if I continue to publish them on my own website, you know, through my own server and all that, you know, at some point that may not be a feasible option. Yeah, and I think that that is how it's going a little bit more, that you have these big sort of um, websites that, uh, that host smaller ones, you know, like Tumblr or Blogger or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's interesting. And And from a security standpoint, it makes sense because... An individual running a website is, you know, having to deal with security concerns is it's mm. kind of outrageous. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we want to be in the business of doing interviews or publishing content or whatnot, not in the business of web design and and internet security. Yeah, so, right. Exactly. At least, at least me, anyway. I mean, <laughs> so it's uh, it's challenging for me because uh, I think having to deal with all the back-end technical issues myself means that doing the interviews and getting them online is a much slower process for me. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. You know, just one reason is I can't put, you know, I couldn't publish an interview every week simply because the bandwidth is just it, too expensive. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's also something that people don't always realize that there is an expense to uh, running sites oh, yeah. the way we do. So, yeah, I've I've been. Uh, well, people make assumptions about that, right? Because yeah. you know you always see, oh, run your website for ten bucks or less, or whatever. Mm -hmm. right? So they just assume if you're running a website, it doesn't cost very much. Mm -hmm. You know, wrong. It, it it costs thousands of dollars a year uh, and it's very pricey to get the level of service required for like a cult of personality uh, mm. to be a stable site that you can access and that loads in any sort of acceptable amount of time it, it's yeah. a lot a lot of money and and work went into doing that yeah. and maintaining it so um, I do get uh, a little bit upset when people just assume that it's a negligible cost because it's anything but negligible yeah that's right and i think especially for podcasts it gets very expensive so. yeah yeah it can i mean I, and i don't I, you know i don't complain about it i'm happy to to do it but uh i i do hope people appreciate the amount of time and effort and money that goes into making it available because it, yeah. is, it is something else yeah indeed so perhaps you could just um say uh, what what plans you you might have for a uh, code of personality um well i continue to publish new uh, podcast interviews um for cult of personality dot net as well as the membership section which has uh, not just extra interviews, but there's essays and research projects and m guided meditations and teachings and things there. So it's a rich environment for additional, it more in-depth material. Mm. Um, and in, in addition to that, uh, I've got a couple of presentations coming up 
Uh, one will be at the uh, Temple of Witchcraft in, in August oh. at their open house event. Uh, and where is that? Sorry, uh, I believe that's in New Hampshire. Okay. And uh, also in the last weekend of September, the Occult Arts Esoteric Salon, Occult Two, is taking place in Salem, Massachusetts, and I'll be presenting at that as well. Oh. So I hope pe if people are able to attend, uh, I'd love to say hello and come out. Um, it'd be great to meet you. Oh, cool. Excellent. Okay, and if people want to find out more about you and certainly about a cult of personality? Sure, cult of personality dot net is the place to go. We also have a Facebook page, just search for a cult of personality and our ubiquitous Twitter feed, which I'm always promoting because uh if you subscribe to the Twitter feed, uh you'll have a much better chance of seeing our updates about new podcast episodes or other interesting links or whatnot, um, whereas Facebook seems to be on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 so I'm told. Okay, Greg, it was great speaking to you again. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on, Angel. It was wonderful to speak with you.